I'm redoing this video on balancing the cables between the driver and passenger side batteries with updated information. Forum discussion we sometimes see is that people notice their passenger side battery fails before the driver's side, and there are some that suggest the battery should be rotated by location to equal the battery life. That just makes for two shorter life batteries. Instead, we should fix the problem. Some believe it's due to the alternator's wiring. In reality, the current flow from the alternator is much smaller compared to the starter's current flow, so that's not the real problem. My Ford service manual shows the starting circuit layout and gauge of the cables from my 2003 vehicle. There is a one aught cable that runs from the driver's side negative terminal to the driver's side frame rail. And then we have another one aught cable running from the passenger's battery to the engine block. The flow from the driver's battery comes through the frame rail, cross member, passenger rail, across a jumper cable, and to the common engine connection point. And the combined current of both batteries then flows up the engine block to the starter. When starting, the current should flow equally out of both batteries, but it doesn't. While many people clean the terminals and upgrade the wires on the top side, it's the underside where, in my opinion, the major problem lies. First, many of us do not pay attention to the negative grounding points at the motor or the frame rails, so cleaning these locations is the first step. And with our trucks getting older, especially in corrosive environments, the riveted connection of the frame assembly becomes compromised electrically. And we can see from the tests of my own truck, even with rust-free stock cable connections, an improvement can still be made. The addition of a 24-inch one aught cable between the driver's battery grounding point on the frame rail and the engine block accomplishes this. The truck may have been fine off the assembly line, but not with a rusted frame. We could just replace the driver's negative cable with a longer one, but the most cost-effective way is just to add a one aught cable between the frame rail and the engine. And you'll need a bolt to attach the cable to the head or the block. There are several locations to bolt to. I use this one that required a 10 mm by 1.5 mm thread, 20 mm long. You should double check any threaded hole you use. The stator standoff mounting hole and the hole above it are 12 mm with a 1.75 mm thread, so you need a 1 half inch eyelet for those. There are many sources to buy this cable, but it's best to get a marine grade cable that has both the wires and lugs tinned to resist oxidation. And this is the video of the cable testing previously done in June 2015. Let's measure what the driver's battery negative cable flows in the factory layout. And now with the addition of the new cable. So stock we peaked at 198 amps and with the additional cable we now flow 247 amps. 50 more amps are now contributed by the driver's battery at the inrush peak. This is a measurement off the new cable to show how much is now flowing directly. So when I tested my truck in the warmer months, we saw this. With the new jumper cable between the frame's grounding point and the engine block, more energy was supplied by the driver's battery, and therefore less by the passenger's battery, improving the balance in the depth of discharge from each. But that only showed the change at the driver's battery. I had an issue recording all the data last summer because the ammeter was too small in range for the passenger side battery. Depth of discharge is important because the higher the depth of discharge, the shorter the battery life. So if we are withdrawing more energy from one battery than the other, we end up with a life cycle chart like this. The point is, one battery becomes weaker in a shorter amount of time. 
Separation can be more extreme, it just depends on how much energy we use from each battery. From December to March, initial start of the day measurements were taken under various temperatures to confirm the results, over two dozen to measure starting current flow. On other days, tests were about alternator output for another video. With a new ammeter, this is how it should have been presented. The batteries are better balanced, but still not perfect. We'll get to that. If you're a power stroke owner, you monitor battery voltage. It's what we do. And you know we see lower voltage when we go to start our trucks in cold weather, the result of reduced capability of the battery. Battery manufacturers tell us about the capacity temperature effect in their ratings. As the battery gets colder, its internal resistance increases, and the voltage pressure drops. As typical with all chemical reactions, the electrolyte lead conversion is slower when it's cold, causing an even steeper downward slope of the capacity. And certainly with these colder temperatures, we are drawing more amps. My intention was to do a more thorough measurement of all the current flows for different cables as I did in the warm weather over the remaining days. But on that 4 degree morning, I developed pneumonia on top of my already having bronchitis. So we're going to have to live with this example. But looking at the data I was able to record, here is what it calculates out to. At 4 degrees Fahrenheit, we draw 141% more power from the batteries while they can only provide 850 amps, 65% as they could at warm temperatures. We end up with a much deeper depth of discharge and shorter battery life. We have higher current flow demands, and with the stock cables, we would have a higher differential in the depth of discharge between the batteries than we saw during warm weather. The point I'm trying to make is balancing the electrical flow from both batteries is important to try to get the best life out of our batteries. If we just switch batteries on a routine basis, one battery is always going to have a higher depth of discharge than the other. Doing that just ensures both batteries will have an equally shorter life caused during the time they reside on the passenger side. But providing an equal pathway for both batteries gives us the longest life from both. But if you look at the top of the table, you'll see there is another cable involved that we didn't talk about before. If we go back to Ford's diagram of the starting system, by adding the one negative jumper cable, we now have consistency of current flow from both batteries on the negative side. But we still have the two gauge cable connecting the positive terminals of the two batteries. And at 70 inches in length, the longer cable has more resistance to flow. In any electrical design, you want all the plumbing or cable to be able to flow the same amount. Or another way to look at it, equal voltage drop. And the issue with this cable didn't show up until the cold weather tests when I was drawing three to four hundred amps from each battery. Bulk Wire had a great calculator on their website. Unfortunately, they just changed it over to a simpler one that conforms to the more stringent Coast Guard standards, not automotive. So I made my own Excel spreadsheet that does the same as their old one. Wirebarn still has an automotive rated calculator on their site, just not as informative as I like because you're limited to their voltage choices. These are the three cables I need to evaluate. By entering the length, target voltage of 10.5, and current flow into the calculator, we can see the voltage drops. And the worst case voltage drop between the 2 gauge cable and the 1 aught negative cables is shown on the right as delta. I've used the current values that I measured peak and sustained at warm and cold temperatures. And as the current demand goes higher, so does the voltage drop, as you would expect. But before I make my decision of what cable I'm going to use, I need to look at a graph. It's an engineering thing. Admittedly, I'm getting deep in the weeds here, 
the voltage drop is very close to the Society of Automotive Engineers recommendation of no more than two tenths of a volt. The automotive service industry usual concern is five tenths of a volt with starting cables. And we don't have an issue starting our trucks. This is just about trying to balance the batteries. I mentioned earlier that I needed to look at the cables graphically. And here is how the charting of all the voltage drops with all the cable sizes works out. We can see the knee of the curve is at the factory 2 gauge size. And larger cable sizes than 2 gauge have diminishing returns. Right where I would expect the factory engineers to choose, which also meets the SAE specs. I could spend a lot of money on the 4 aught cable, but this is an exercise in doing this cost effectively, not for show. And going to a larger cable here is not going to increase the flow over both of the battery's negative side cables. From my measurements, I know that at my coldest winter temperatures, the truck was drawing a little over 410 amps from each battery. And by using the calculator table for 410 amps, I can see that I need a 3 aught cable to match what the negative cables flow at that current. The size of the cable depends on the current draw due to the temperature environment you are in. But the additional cable just needs to be between a 2 gauge and 1 aught cable. 1 aught for 0 degree Fahrenheit starting temperatures. Larger than that would not improve the voltage due to the limitation of the negative cables. Now I could have just replaced the entire OE positive cables with a 3 aught cable, but that will require reworking the factory starter cable connection. Instead I can just run another cable in parallel as I'm trying to do this cost effectively. So how did I determine the capacity of combining cables? Normally I would use Wirebarn's combined wire size calculator. This calculates an effective wire size if you combine wires and cables in parallel. But the problem is it won't calculate cables over size 1 gauge. So we are left to do this the old fashioned way, using a chart that shows details about wires and cables. We need to use the cross sectional area values. The OE 2 gauge cable shows it has an area of 33.6 millimeters. If we use a pair of 2 gauge cables in parallel, that would have a combined area of 67.2 millimeters, effectively a 2 watt cable. If we want the equivalent of a 3 watt cable, it's simple. A 3 watt cable has an area of 85 millimeters, and the existing 2 gauge cable 33.6 millimeters. 33.6 from 85 equals 51.4. So by adding a 1 watt cable in parallel, we will achieve the result. My cold temperature testing data was stopped at the additional 2 gauge cable due to my need for self preservation. It had showed that at the sustained level of 300 amps it worked well, but a little undersized for the peak current around 400 amps. I believe my final choice of an additional 1 aught cable meets my goals of balancing how the batteries are used in my environment, and depending on your own needs, it can be done cost effectively. From the 2003 Ford Bodybuilder's Handbook for Companies Adding High Current Electrical Equipment, if required, add an additional frame to engine ground cable to improve the ground path to the battery. I'm working on at least two more videos, one comparing different alternators that I've had on my truck and about FICM and PCM grounding. Thanks for viewing.